It's Jared Turn. A couple of years ago, if you had asked me, hey, Jericho, what is your favourite game? You might have gotten different answers depending on how I was feeling at the time. I might have said Batman, Arkham City, The Binding of Isaac, Minecraft, or some other game that I was really nostalgic for. I'd have my reasons for loving these games. Sure, I could explain the wonder of gliding across the city as Batman, jumping from enemy to enemy seamlessly thanks to the game's combat style. Combined with the stealth sections where one mistake and you're dead, it made the game incredibly tense, and yet you felt very powerful. The unlimited replayability of Isaac, the many characters you can unlock alongside the many items that you can unlock, made for an experience where every run was different. The gameplay was very simple, yet extremely skillful, easy to learn, hard to master. The peaceful and tranquility of Minecraft alongside the challenge of hardcore. The endless possibilities of what you can build, playing multiplayer with your friends and the stories that are born from that. These games are absolutely incredible games, no doubt, and still in my top 5 to be certain. However, I discovered a game earlier this year that blows all of those games away. And that game is Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight is basically everything you can want in a game. It's difficult, but not unfair. The music is fantastic. It's stupid cheap. The DLC is free. It has memorable characters alongside memorable locations, customizability in the form of charms, and a gorgeous art style. It's made by just a small team called Team Cherry, living in Adelaide, South Australia. And for the record, I love indie games. Something about them is just charming. All of this makes for a game that I would be a bit silly to not have considered for my favorite game. And sure enough, it is my favorite game. I listen to its bop and soundtrack on the way to work. I eagerly wait for any Silk Song news. Oh god, please, any Silk Song news. Hollow Knight is so incredible, and yet it still seems to be a sleeper hit. Sure, 2.8 million copies sounds like a lot, but Hollow Knight is just not a game I see spoken about enough. When someone asks me what I've been playing and I tell them Hollow Knight, I often get a response such as, what's that? On top of that, I'm pretty sure I've seen every Hollow Knight video on YouTube, the most popular of which is The Game Theorist, and it's not even that great if I'm being honest. So I'm here to scream to the void like I do on Twitter about how much I enjoy this game, whether or not people will listen. Let's start with the music. Sure, you may not think that music is very important to a game, but think of where Mario would be without his classic tune. Or where the entire Sonic franchise's reputation would be without the music. <laughs> Hollow Knight's music is tranquil, peaceful, and relaxing. But if that's not what you're looking for, it's also got upbeat and adventurous tracks. The music of Hollow Knight was composed by Christopher Larkin. Just look at him. Chris Larkin, you beautiful bastard. How do you do it? The music represents each of the game's areas incredibly well, from the sense of loneliness and loss in Dirtmouth. To the more cheerful liveliness chirp of Greenpath. A sudden sense of urgency to slay the Moss Knights as the music swells upon their appearance. The calming nature of the resting music that plays while you rest near hot springs or on the tramway. And how could I not mention the City of Tears track? It's full of discovery and wonder, which really fits as this is when the game starts to open up. Our little bug is not even halfway through its journey at this point. Of course, not all the music in Hollow Knight is ambient music to fit certain areas. You also have the boss music that plays. Mantis Wolves has to be one of the best songs in the game. It's fast paced to match the intensity of being attacked by two bosses at once, and the increase in reaction speed it demands when compared to previous bosses. The 
God Home version of this fight, titled Sisters of Battle, takes us and cranks it up a notch to signify the added danger of the third sister. The Radiance's boss music is the perfect fit for final boss music, starting with a loud crescendo and the piano constantly repeating in the background to keep you on your toes. It also has a larger than life feel to it, a sort of awe. This is betrayed by the trumpets. The pure vessel boss music is perfect in such a unique way. It isn't fast paced and in your face, it is simply there to exaggerate the glory of what our little bug is doing. That is, facing the pure vessel. The Hollow Knight in its pure form. The absolute awe of the feat that is being attempted is palpable in this track. The track slowly increasing from being a simple track about emphasizing the wonder of the pure vessel, then the sense of hopelessness in defeating the pure vessel. All this at the end of the fourth and most difficult pantheon so far. This is it. This is what it has all come to. Hands are sweaty. One mistake could be the end for our little bug. And despite all odds, our little bug comes out victorious. And as the soundtrack ends, the pure vessel simply concedes and accepts defeat. Joining your siblings amongst the void. So, basically what I'm trying to say is the soundtrack in this game is incredible. Good job, Chris. Bangers all around. I said earlier that Hollow Knight is difficult but not unfair, and that extends to all of the gameplay. While the most obvious example of this would be the combat, learning enemy patterns, when to use spells and mastering the movement system to avoid attack, another is the movement system itself. While I wouldn't call Hollow Knight's movement system very challenging, it is quite strange. The movement is extremely tight which allows for pinpoint precision. The jumps feel heavy and the direction can be altered freely whilst midair. Most other movement systems are fairly floaty to allow for margins of error. This has led to me missing my fair share of jumps in Hollow Knight, where I felt the knight should have had more hang time before falling. But how precise the movement controls of Hollow Knight are play perfectly into the combat. Mastering how often you can spam your dash, or time your shadow dash, will be absolutely necessary to avoid damage. The heaviness of your jump allows for the player to thread the needle in what can be often chaotic situations. Another facility of the movement system is knockback applied after hitting an enemy. Sure, you could negate this effect by using the steady body jump. However, this feels unnatural and like you have ripped something vital out of the game's movement system. The added difficulty of your position shifting when striking an enemy allows for more control for the player. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the amount of knockback the player receives is always the same, and as such it becomes a part of your moveset. Hitting an enemy before retreating could result in damaging the player. However, with the added knockback of an attack, it may be enough distance for you to be able to get some damage off safely. It's a risk versus reward mechanic. You risk taking damage for the reward of completing combat encounters faster, not having to wait for clear openings in enemy attack patterns. Unfortunately, most of this is negated as soon as the Mothwing Cloak is added to your arsenal alongside the ability to dash. However, in very niche circumstances where you cannot perform a full dash length backwards, this can come in handy. Of course, the most difficult thing in Hollow Knight is the combat itself. It's a combination of avoiding fast-paced attacks and movements and discovering the right time to use spells or to heal up. Almost all of the bosses of Hollow Knight require extreme amounts of concentration and lightning fast reaction time at least in the later half of the game. When facing a boss for the first time, it is almost guaranteed that you will die. This means that the main method of beating bosses comes down to first facing the boss, dying, facing the boss again, dying, rinse and repeat, maybe switching out and experimenting with your charm loadout here and there. And on the surface, this sounds very boring and repetitive, however, Hollow Knight avoids this by having constant progression. Every time you face a boss, you learn a little more about the boss's movements. You get just a little farther in the fight. Maybe you find a new opportunity to heal where you didn't see one before. Or just maybe you get far enough into the fight to see this. The boss gets winded. This is such a simple way of communicating to the player that they're progressing in the fight. There's no need for a health bar covering half the screen and distracting the player. It's genius. When the boss is winded, it also opens a few options for the player. Perhaps you get a quick heal off, or maybe you decide to charge up an ale bar, or maybe you might even decide to launch off a flurry of spells. Some players may have played the game for so long that they think any boss is too easy for them. This is solved with the addition of the free DLC Hidden Dreams 
which adds harder dream versions of pre-existing bosses, the Grim Troop, which adds new DLCs to interact with, with two new bosses, and Godmaster, which is literally a boss rush mode plus three brand new bosses and two significantly harder versions of previous bosses. Discovering and failing these bosses keeps the game fresh and difficult for older players, and with the ascended and radiant difficulties of all bosses, veteran players are still challenged by the game. Some games fall into the trap of having so many abilities that some end up becoming redundant and you're funneled into one viable way of playing. Hollow Knight avoids this by making many different playstyles viable. This is done by facilitating change through charms and not just raw upgrades. There are upgrades to all your abilities and nails, sure, but they are not as influential as your charm loadout. Maybe with the exception of the nail, but that's the topic for another video. For example, you could have a purely nail build only using soul to heal. Strength, quick slash, mark of pride, and soul catcher. A pure spell build, soul eater, soul catcher. Shaman Stone, and Spell Twister. A more defensive build, Lifeblood Core, Quick Focus, Boulder's Shell, Fragile Heart, and Spore Shroom. By allowing players to choose their own playstyle, this means that my experience may differ from your own, may differ from Jimmy's down the road, or even from Chris's. You beautiful bastard. Charms also allow for different ways to traverse the world of Hallowness. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the name of the kingdom. I forgot to say that earlier. If you're a greedy little bugger like myself, the Gathering Swarm Charm is for you. Or maybe you get lost a lot, much like I did in my first playthrough, then the Wayward Compass is for you. Maybe Fast you're fast as fuck, boy. boy. Dashmaster is there, just for you. Maybe you're super lazy and the third Colosseum trial scares you. <coughs> the Weaverlings will fight for you. Charms allow for each player to pick unique and interesting ways of exploring the world and facing enemies. This means that even on repeat playthroughs, you can have a completely different experience. To say that Team Cherry did a great job creating and fleshing out the world of Hallowness would be an understatement. The world feels lived in, from the cheery ongoings of the residents of Greenbath to the feeling of rotten decay that the Royal Waterways gives off. This is achieved by a mix of the incredible art and sound design. The dark color palette of the Royal Waterways mixed with the just disgusting sound effects that accompany the area make it tense and gives a sense of urgency to leave in order to alleviate the immense discomfort. Fittingly, the further you get into the Royal Waterways and the closer you get to the Fluke Mom, the more you hear the unnerving sounds of the Fluke Mon. Traveling further past the Fluke Mon, you encounter the Fluke Munger. The soft moans that can be heard echoing off the walls put you on high alert, and when you see it with nowhere to run, it is genuinely frightening. I was actually startled in this clip, and I knew what to expect. Contrasting this is the cheery, goofy sounds of Green Path alongside its much brighter color palette. The moys moss creep make as they emerge from the grass. The almost cartoony sound of moss king trying to attack the player, and the subsequent death sound is equally as goofy. And while Hollow Knight exceeds at this mood setting through ambience, it can also be done through the behavior of NPCs you encounter. For example, the royal retainers in the White Palace mumbling until you come close, which allows the music to take center stage again. The Dream Nail dialogue shows that they are patiently waiting for the king to return. Why then do they bow when you come close? Is it because you're a vessel born from the king? Or, how about the dead silence of the ancient basin, or you hear your own footsteps and the scurrying of shadow creepers? You aren't supposed to be here. No one has been here for a long time. The game sets the mood of the area so subtly that you probably wouldn't notice on a first playthrough. Maybe you always just thought that the residents of Green Pass seemed cheery, or that the ancient basin just felt... out of place. Unnerving. But could you nail down why straight away? I'd wager to say probably not. After thinking about it, you could, but it is done so subtly that it just ends up being the way you feel about those areas. The world building is also great for a game like this, where a lot of the story is left ambiguous. As I mentioned earlier, the White Palace raises so many questions with just the way the NPCs react. However, the actual conclusions of which, I'll leave that up to the experts. There isn't a much better show of this world building in action than the Mantis Village. Aside from some small dialogue the player can have with Quirrell and Cloth, both of which can be completely missed, the story of the Mantis is told through the world building. Scattered on the way to the Mantis Village, you can see clear signs of advanced infrastructure, doors locked by switches, hanging lumafly lanterns, and structures that seem to be made to carve out areas of the fungal waste. Getting closer to the Mantis Village, you see masks of large creatures on pikes. Whatever is in the area ahead is going to be a formidable foe. Sure enough, the Mantises are the toughest normal enemy you have encountered so far. It strikes quickly, we'll step back from your attacks and has a reach with its claws. Traveling further in, you find a sign that warns you of a swift death upon the claws of the mantises. Traveling through the village, you find plenty of spike pits and traps. Once you arrive at the mantis lords, they do not attack. In fact, you can just leave the way you came. However, if you try to push on further into deep nest, they will shut the entrance before you're able to do so. Fighting the mantis lords requires the player to challenge them upon their own accord. They aren't like other creatures you've encountered. They're civil and only fight when challenged. After besting the mantis lords, the mantises around the village will not attack. Instead, they bow, and you are rewarded access to a room with a lot of geo in the Mark of Pride. All of this world building paints a picture of a tribe that avoided the infection unlike all the other creatures in Hallowness. A tribe that prides itself on strength, a tribe that is both strong enough and smart enough to resist the infection and fend off the creatures of Deep Nest. All of this is shown simply by the environmental design alongside the behavior of the mantises. <laughs> Thank you.
On your journey through Hallowness, you will encounter a number of friendly faces and more not so friendly faces. Almost all of these NPCs are memorable and charming in their own way. From the totally legit bank that Mirabelle is running to the snarkiness of Relatic Alert, the absolute power and beauty of Zote. The bravery of Cloth, the sad tale of Myla, and the totally harmless snacking of Willow. However, one of the first of these is Hornet. While at first she tries to murder you, she also seems to be leading and assisting the player on their journey. While you'd think that after Hornet ambushes the player, they would be more wary of following her into the city. Of everyone I've watched play Hollow Knight, almost all of them do. In fact, they usually seem excited to see Hornet again. And, luckily for our little bug friend, Hornet does not ambush you a second time. Instead, she basically dumps a bunch of lore on you and tells you to go find the grave in Ash. This, at the moment, doesn't mean anything to the player and you basically don't see Hornet for the rest of the game, unless you go for the true ending, in which you can find Hornet at the cast-off shell in Kingdom's Edge. There, she will test your strength once more to see if you are truly worthy of freeing Hallow Nest. So, Hornet is unique in the sense that she tries to kill you twice. However, when you talk to her after leaving the Abyss or outside the Temple of the Black Egg, you start to feel she's less trying to stop your journey and instead is trying to assist you in it. So, why is Hornet one of those NPCs that the fandom almost collectively loves? I believe it's familiarity. Meeting Hornet for the first time, it's obvious off the bat that she and our little bug boy are somehow related. Their masks are similar and they are roughly the same size, so immediately you gain this sense of familiarity, this constant among all the chaos and other bugs you encounter along your journey. This is also why players are so excited to see Hornet outside the city. After traversing through the alien-like area of the fungal waste, Hornet's familiar looks bring a sense of safety. Obviously, things such as Hornet beginning to help and taking a liking to our little bug would contribute to why she's loved so much. She's also the only real constant in your journey. She's there at the beginning, middle, and end. When you first enter Dirtmouth, Elderbug is the first person you'll meet. Or maybe you won't, you monster. Look, look, you made him sad. You happy? You happy, huh? Look, you, you ruined his life. <clears throat> Elderbug is an interesting and cool dude. He resides in Dirtmouth. Talking to him throughout your journey, he'll give you his perspective on things. It's quite nice to hear from someone who isn't down the depths exploring. He's just a regular bug trying to live a peaceful life. Having seen the decay of Hallowness and maybe the loss of a loved one, he has lost all hope. However, a little bug boy can restore his hope by just doing the nice gesture of offering him a flower. A delicate flower. The Hunter is an interesting NPC, mostly because of the journal that he gives you. While it does work nicely as a bestiary, the Hunter seems to know a whole lot about the Kingdom of Hallowness and its inhabitants. Reading each of the Hunter's entries gives us a look into what the Hunter is like. It's a fierce, powerful creature that only lives for the hunt and nothing more, and it... Oh. The Last Dag is one of the most helpful NPCs you'll encounter throughout your journey. Being able to catch a ride on the back of him all around the kingdom to the many stag stations is a godsend when backtracking or just general convenience getting around. All the many stations, now in ruin and non-operational, makes you wonder what it was like when Hallowness was at its peak. Stags coming and going, transporting bugs and goods all across the kingdom. It would have been a sight to behold. So, I'm a little sympathetic to The Last Dag when he mentions a tram pass that you have acquired. Despite calling it a grotesque machine that it could never even attempt to do what the stags do, I don't think he truly believes that. As he mentions, the stags tire easily as they grow old. Most don't even have the chance to grow old. He's lost hope for the fate of the stags. He's the last. They're extinct. Is what I would say. However, upon opening all the stag stations, our friend discovers the stag nest. And, upon arrival, all that can be seen is piles and piles of dead stags. And just one hashtag alongside a simple name change. Leg Eater is oddly charming. I mean, look at the guy. I wouldn't call him the most appealing bug to look at, but strangely I feel comfortable just chilling with him by the fireplace. Sure, I suppose that he also sells you some of the most useful charms in the game, and you will return to him multiple times in your journey if you're bad at the game like myself, but he's a simple bug. He just wants Geo. Enough Geo and he'll be the king. It almost makes you want to keep breaking your charms just to give your man some more Geo. What makes Legator stand out the most, and what I believe makes him so memorable, are the little interactions that he has. Sure, you can call it Stockholm Syndrome, but I think him liking the smell of the Defender's Crest and giving you a discount for it is pretty neat. I think how upset he is that you broke his gift you just made for you is endearing. And sure, while maybe he's just making more to take Jira from me, I really don't care anything for Legator. Of course, you can't talk about Legator without mentioning Divine. Added in the Grim Troop DLC, Divine will offer to reinforce your fragile charm so that they are no longer broken upon death. She bears a striking resemblance to Leg Eater, well, at least the top half of her anyway. And sure enough, once you reinforce one of your charms and go talk to Leg Eater, he will remark how wonderful the smell is. Um... Yeah. After reinforcing all of your charms, Legator proclaims that he knows where the smell is coming from. He's going to go and find it. And find it he does. If you re-enter Divine's tent afterwards, you will see Legator's forelegs lying on the ground. She will thank you for one final gift, and remarks on how much she liked it. Dream nailing her, you can see that she is crazy about how exquisite the experience was. And if you know anything about mantises, then well, good on our boy Legator. 
The nail smith is both extremely helpful and interesting. He yearns to make a pure nail. It's what he spent his entire life attempting. He's always fallen short because he's never had the pale ore to do so. Pale ore, which is extremely powerful, much like the pale beans it shares a connection to. Of course, the nail smith is where you upgrade and make your nail stronger, so you will be visiting him multiple times throughout your journey. The first couple of times, he doesn't seem much like a character. He simply tells you to return with more pale ore. However, once you finally forge the pure nail, the nail smith has a moment of realization. His whole life has been lived trying to forge this pure, perfect nail. And here it is. He's done it. He's completed his life goal. So where can he go from here? He's done everything that he's wanted. As Hallowness crumbled around him, he just kept forging. After stepping outside, he asked the knight to cut him down with a pure nail. He's created it, and now his life has no meaning. He must feel the glory of his magnum opus. You have two, uh, three options. You can fulfill his wish and cut him down with his own creation. His body will later be found floating in the junk pit, where even in death, he is thinking about his pure nail. You can also choose to spare him. Doing so will have the nail smith somehow make it to Shio's hut in Greenbath. There he lives out his days happy with Shio, finding new meaning in life. All the other things in life that he missed out on when he was focused on forging the pure nail. Sculpting the great knights of Hallowness, who he ignored in his quest for the nail. Doing so opens his eyes a bit more, remarking that he never knew he was capable of such intricate detail after spending an eternity crudely hacking away at nails. He lives out his life happy with Shio, finally at peace, finally not alone. Also, you can use spells on him and still kill him, you monster. He said use the nail, not spells. Why do you hate him? What did he do to you? Quirrell is another one of those NPCs that you'll see a lot throughout your journey of Hallow Nest, much like Horner or Tisa. You first meet Quirrell in the Temple of the Black Egg. Here, he makes fun of how short you are and mentions that he feels drawn to Hallow Nest for some unknown reason. He then makes fun of your nail. You then run into him again at the Temple of the Lake of Un, sharpening his nail. Quirrell can be found again at Queen Station, mentioning how busy these stations must have been throughout their time operational. Again at the Mantis Village, if you die to the Mantis Lords, he will mention that the Mantises managed to hold off the infection from corrupting their minds, which is a nice little bit of world building. He also mentions the Nailsmith, remarking that your nail is blunt, and that the Nailsmith could improve it and make it much easier for you. Interestingly enough, Quirrell has Dream Nail dialogue for all four of these encounters, despite the fact that you don't get the Dream Nail until long after these areas. In his Dream Nail dialogue at the Black Egg, Lake of Un, and Mantis Village, it is heavily implied that Quirrell has amnesia of some sort, and that looking at the Dreamer's mask on the eggs makes his mind blank. He comments on how he knows of Un's presence in the lake and the existence, even the look of the nailsmith without understanding why he would know these things. You can continue to see Quirrell throughout the kingdom. As you enter the City of Tears, Quirrell is found resting on a bench and mentions the lake above that drips water down into the city, saying, what a sight it must be. After scaling the Crystal Peak, Quirrell is found gazing off into the distance, reflecting on the sad nature of the bugs below. You can even find him vibing in the hot springs and deepness, which makes the area a lot more comforting than it usually is. Of course, the big moment, you encounter Quirrell outside the teacher's archives, where he speaks of an odd familiarity to running him in. Once inside, you come face to face with Umu, who is seemingly undefeated. Until your boy Bibbly Bop Bop Bibbly Bop Bop Hop saves the bloody day. That's right. Even if you have the strongest nail you can possibly achieve, you can't do anything, but your boy Quirrell just pops Umu like it's nothing. After defeating Umu and descending more into the teacher's archive, you will find a tank with Monomon inside, where Quirrell will join you. He ponders if Monomon also caught our little bug here, much like she did Quirrell. Quirrell tells us about Monomon, and how she was the smartest bug in Hallowness, and wanted to store all of her knowledge here, in the archives. Quirrell then takes off his mask hat thing, and reveals Monomon's complete body. After breaking Monomon's seal, Quirrell comments on how he is beginning to feel his age. The next time you see Quirrell is at the Blue Lake, just kinda chillin', admiring the lake. When spoken to, Quirrell reminisces on the two journeys of Hallowness that he has embarked on, and although he does not remember the first journey, he is glad that in his second one, he was able to meet our little bug boy and witness the wonders of Hallowness. He's now at peace, and upon the next visit to the Blue Lake, Quirrell's nowhere to be seen. going to be a quick fire sort of round of things I couldn't neatly fit into the other segment. Finding all the grubs is great, and the rewards are pretty fair also. They're adorable. The pins that you can buy from Zelda take away from the level design, which is meant to be memorable. The Wayward Compass is different, as it is more of a first playthrough sort of thing. The progression of this game is really well paced. It picks up quite a lot once you enter the City of Tears, which gives you time to familiarize yourself with the world of Hallowness. The hidden Kickstarter room in the Spheric Glade is explained in game, which I think is pretty nifty. All of the unique designs in the Glade are also an example of how much unnecessary love was put into this game. The hidden dream boss is ramping into difficulty the more you fight them is the sort of addition that wasn't necessary but Team Cherry put it in anyway. It could have just been a one fight sort of deal. What the hell was a monster in Deepness? What the hell is this thing? What the hell is this lifeblood creature? And why is it in God Home? Is it a higher being? The high still feels tacked on even after all the additions since release. Legate's fireplace being made out of broken charms is neat. A little bug boy holds a map. 
when looking at the map. All of the charm combinations weren't needed, but they're a really cool addition. The challenge of the Colosseum of Fools is really good until you get the pure nail, at which point it becomes pretty easy. The Radiance is actually kind of easy when you first fight her as well, and the Pantheons are easy without bindings on at least charms. The Path of Pain is a neat little hidden secret, and I think rewarding lore instead of something big was very clever on Team Cherry's part. Despite being a glorified fetch quest, the Grim Troop expansion manages to keep the player engaged by increasing the difficulty of the enemies. Nightmare King Grim is one of the best and most balanced fights in the game. There's very little RNG, and it's all a matter of mastering the flow of his attacks, unlike the pure vessel and this stupid fucking jump thing it does. Primal aspids can fucking die. Also, sometimes this rock flickers when you focus, I don't know, man. So after rambling on for about 27 minutes, I hope you've gained an idea as to why Hollow Knight is my favourite game. It's full of charm that only indie games seem to have, and it's really special to me. I mean, it is now my third most played game. Really, it's my second most played game. The only reason Batman is so high is because it's such a pain to close out of the game, but I digress. I find myself coming back and playing Hollow Knight occasionally, and what feels like minutes in the world of Hallowness is actually hours. I find myself so invested and immersed in its world, and its gameplay loop is incredible. Also, maybe one day I'll beat Pantheon 4 and 5 of all bindings. <laughs>